Brothers and sisters, it is an incredible pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker. Naomi, candidly, is a Canadian treasure. She has worldwide influence. Her books are bestsellers, of course. Her first book, No Logo, and of course, I would expect most of us in this room have read the real big one, Shock Doctrine. Frankly, Naomi, I think that Shock Doctrine was even better than your first book. It described exactly how the powers of B have manipulated crisis, have manipulated disasters to reinforce their own power and privilege. We had Naomi to our CRW Council several years ago, and I know that Naomi has spoke at many CEP uh, councils and events as well. So it's only fitting, candidly, that she's here with us today to help us launch our new union. In fact, if you take a look in your convention documents, if you take a look in the kits, you're going to see that we talk about shock doctrine. So if we have learned from you, frankly, if you look at why we're forming our union, it's exactly about a lot of the things that you talk about in shock doctrine. So we need to come up with our own shock doctrine, our own recipe for how to respond to these crises, but in a positive way. Right now, Naomi is working with her partner, Avi Lewis, on their, on, a, on their next big book, on her next big book, but also with a movie that goes with it. It's going to be in about global warming and what, we need to do, and what we need to do to stop it. And hopefully, Naomi, when you're doing your next book and you're doing your film, we're going to talk about jobs, and we're going to talk about how we can create millions of jobs by investing in the environment if we do it right. Naomi... Thank you for being such a passionate voice for hope and justice in Canada and around the world. Your presence is here today is proof positive that Unifor will be a powerful social union from day one. What we demand for our members, we demand for all working people on this planet. Thank you for being who you are and thank you so much for doing what you do and thank you so much for being here. Brothers and sisters, Sister Naomi Klein. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jerry. How's everyone feeling today? Okay? You know, I was supposed to speak last night, but things were a little behind schedule, and they basically told me I had a choice between hungry or hungover, so don't make me regret that choice, okay? Um, I want to thank all of my friends uh, at the unions formerly known as CAW and CEP, specifically Jim Stanford, Josh Coles, Dave Coles, Ken Loenza, many others. And of course I want to offer my heartfelt congratulations to Jerry and to the entire new executive board of Unifor. I'm so happy and honored to be sharing this historic convention with all of you. The energy in the room last night when Jerry spoke was contagious. It was electric. And so is the hope that the founding of this new union is inspiring across the country. It feels like this could be the beginning of the fight back that we've all been waiting for, the one that will chase Harper from power and restore the power of working people in Canada. So, so welcome to the world, Unifor. You know, a lot of the media coverage of this new union has focused on how big you are. Uh, the biggest private sector union in Canada. We've heard that again and again. And when you're facing as many attacks as working people in Canada are facing, big can be really handy. It can be very helpful. But I think, as you know, being big is not a victory in itself. The victory comes when you use this huge platform that you've created to think big and dream big and make big, bold demands and take big actions. The kind of actions that will shift the public imagination and change our sense of what's possible. And it's that kind of big that I want to talk to you about today. Now, as Jerry mentioned, I wrote a book called The Shock Doctrine a few years ago. And it argues that over the past 35 years, corporate interests and their political tools have used 
various forms of crises, mostly economic crises, but also natural disasters, also wars, to prey on the fear and dislocation and panic in those moments, to ram through policies that lack democratic support, policies that enrich a small elite, that shred regulations, privatize the public goods, and slash public spending. And I agree completely with Jerry that we need our own version of this, but we don't need a shock doctrine. We don't need disaster capitalism. We need uh, disaster collectivism. We need to use crisis to push for solutions that actually solve the underlying reasons why the crises are taking place. We need solutions that deepen democracy, not do away with it in times of crisis. And this is the kind of change that we need to talk about. Now, Jim Stanford and Fred Wilson, in their paper laying out Unifor's vision, talk about what, what's happening to workers in this country and around the world as an example of the shock doctrine. They talk about how the economic crisis that was set off in 2008 by the banks is being used systematically around the world to attack the people least responsible for that crisis. We see this with a mass uh, slashing of salaries in Greece, where Avi and I were filming a few months ago, um, where the crisis is just being used to devastate the middle and working class. We see it happening right now in Detroit, where this cooked up bankruptcy is being used to attack pensions. We see it here in Canada with the attacks on trade unions, blaming their own policy failures on you. I don't want to spend my time here today proving that this tactic this ugly tactic is alive and well, uh, pr exploiting, continuing to exploit public fear for private gain. You know that, you are living it. What I want to talk about is how we fight it, because that's what we need to figure out. And I'll be honest with you, when I wrote the shock doctrine, I thought that just understanding how this tactic worked, just naming it and describing it, would be enough to stop it. We had this slogan when, when we launched the book, which was, information is shock resistance, arm yourself. But I have to admit something to you, and that's that I was wrong. Just knowing what's happening, just rejecting their story and saying to politicians and bankers, no, you created this crisis, not us. No, we're not broke. It's just that you're hoarding all the money. That may be true, but it's not enough. It's not even enough when we can mobilize millions of people to the streets to shout, we won't pay for your crisis, as they've been doing across Europe now for years in Greece, Spain, Italy, France, Britain. These are amazingly inspiring mobilizations, and they're not just one-off rallies. I mean, we're talking about occupying squares for weeks. And we've occupied Wall Street and Bay Street and countless other streets with this same message. But the cuts keep coming. The austerity keeps coming. Now, some of these movements that have emerged in recent years have staying power, but we've also seen them arrive, raise huge hopes that the fight back is finally here, and then they seem to sort of disappear or fizzle out. And I think part of the reason for that is that we're trying to organize in the rubble of this 30-year war that has been waged on the collective sphere and workers' rights. The young people in the streets, in those, in those squares, are the children of that war. And that war has been so complete, so successful, that too often these social movements actually don't have anywhere left to stand. So we have to occupy a park, or we have to occupy a square just to have a meeting. Or you have young people building an amazing power base in their schools, in their universities, but a student's relationship with their school is transient by its very nature. It only lasts for a few years. So they're vulnerable. This transience makes our movements far too easy to evict simply by waiting them out in some cases, or all too often by applying brute state force, which is what's happened in far too many cases. And this is one of the reasons why the creation of Unifor and your promise of reviving social unionism building not just a big union, but a vast and muscular network of social movements has raised so much hope. Because the desire for radical change is out there, but in order to turn it into a reality, we need each other. 
These new social movements that we've seen bring a lot to the table. The ability to mobilize large numbers of people, as we've seen, real diversity, a willingness to take big risks, as well as new methods of organizing that include a deep commitment to democracy. And we saw that in really inspiring ways during Occupy Wall Street. But these new movements also need you. They need your institutional strength, your radical history, and perhaps most of all, your ability to act as an anchor so that we don't keep rising up and sort of floating away. We need you to be our fixed address, our base, so that the next time we come together will be impossible to evict. We also... We also need your powerful organizing skills because, as so many other speakers have said, we need to figure out together how to organize in the rubble of neoliberalism, how to build sturdy new collective structures amidst the chaos that has been created and the atomization, the rampant individuality, individualism. Your innovative, groundbreaking idea of community chapters is a terrific start in this process, and we're all very excited to see where that goes. It's also important to remember that you're not starting this process of thinking how we build these coalitions from scratch. You have a history, a long history to draw on, mistakes to learn from. A remarkable group of people gathered a little less than a year ago uh, for the Port Elgin Assembly and produced what they called the Making Waves Agenda. It's a great document, and I urge you all to read it if you can. Its most important message is that when we come together in coalitions, they can't just be a bunch of leaders meeting in a room and saying, we're a coalition now. It can't just be letterhead. It has to be coming from the bottom up with full engagement from members. Organizing has to be at its center, and we have to invest massively in education. Education about the ideological and structural reasons why we ended up where we are. We have to build on that solid base. And that means getting out there and talking to people face to face, as you well know, not just the public, not just the media, but your own members, to build on this analysis that we share. But there's something else too, a deeper reason why I believe, despite all of the public rejection of these austerity policies, why we haven't been able to win big victories against the shock doctrine so far. Now here's what it is. I think even when there is mass resistance to these policies, something is stopping us collectively, not just in Canada, but around the world, from fully rejecting the neoliberal agenda. And I think what it is, is that we don't fully believe that it's possible to build something in its place. And this once again has to do with the success of the neoliberal project, because for my generation and for people younger than me, deregulation, privatization, and cutbacks are all we've ever known. We have very little experience building or dreaming. All we've seen is the dismantling of what previous generations have built. All we know how to do is defend. And what I've come to understand is really the key to resisting the shock doctrine, is that we can't just reject the dominant story about how the world works. We need our own story about what the world can be. We can't just reject their lies. We need truths so powerful that their lies dissolve on contact with them. We can't just reject their project. We need our own fully articulated and inspiring project. We know what Stephen Harper's project is. He has one idea for how to build the economy. Dig lots of holes, lay lots of pipe. Stick the stuff from the pipes onto ships or trucks or trains and take it to places where it will be refined and burned. Repeat only more faster before anyone figures out that this is his one idea. That's what allows him to maintain the false illusion that he is some kind of responsible economic manager for this country, while the rest of the economy falls apart. And if that's why it's so important for this government to accelerate oil and gas production at this outrageous pace, why they have declared war on everyone standing in their way, whether environmentalists or First Nations, 
And it's also why the Harper government has been willing to sacrifice the manufacturing sector in this country, attacking many of your members, waging war on workers, and attacking basic organizing rights. This is not just about the specific resources being extracted. In my view, Harper represents an extreme version of a particular worldview, one that I started calling extractivism, but I sometimes still just call capitalism. It's, it's an approach to the world based on taking, taking without giving back, taking as if there were no limits to what can be taken, no limit to what workers' bodies can take, no limits to what a functioning society can take, and no limits to what the planet can take. It's a mindset that sees everything in terms of its value to the bottom line. In the extractivist mindset, labor is a commodity to be extracted just like bitumen is a commodity to be extracted with maximum value extracted from that resource no matter the consequences to, you, to your workers' health, social fabric, human rights. No cost is too high. And when crisis hits, there's one solution on the table, which is just do it more and do it faster. So that's their story. It's a really simple one to get your head around. And it's a story that we're trapped in because it's the story of growth above all else. And it's the story that they use as a weapon against all of us in different ways. If we're going to defeat that story, we need a different story, a story of our own. So I want to offer to you what I believe is the most powerful counter-narrative progressives have ever had against that brutal logic. You might not agree with me right away. Please bear with me. Here it is. Our current economic model is not only waging war on workers, on communities, on public services, and on social safety nets. It's waging a war on the life support systems of the planet itself, the conditions for life on Earth. I'm talking about climate change, and it's not just another issue to be tacked on to a list of other issues that you have to worry about. Climate change is a civilizational wake-up call it's a message spoken in the language of fires, floods, storms, and droughts, telling us that we need an entirely new economic model, one based on justice and sustainability. It is telling us that when you take, you must also take care. You must also give back. That there are limits past which we cannot push, hard limits, that our future health lies not in digging ever deeper holes to get at the harder and harder to reach fossil fuels, but digging deeper and deeper within ourselves to understand how all of our fates are interconnected. It's a big task. And one last thing. We need to make that civilizational shift yesterday because our emissions are going in the exact wrong direction and there's very little time left. We certainly don't have time for another Harper majority. We need to make this shift by the end of the decade. Now, I know that talking about climate change can be uncomfortable for those of you who work in the extractive industries or in manufacturing sectors producing high carbon products like cars and planes. I also know that despite these personal fears and those real risks that both the CAW and the CEP have adopted all kinds of great climate policies and in fact have been visionary in the international labor scene. And this isn't some recent conversion. CEP fought for the Kyoto Protocol way back in the 1990s when their American counterparts were doing no such thing. And the CAW has been pushing the big three automakers to see past carbon intensive vehicles for many years. Dave Coles got arrested protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. That was heroic. So you're building on a tradition. But let's be honest. I think it's fair to say that climate change hasn't traditionally been your members' greatest passion. And I can relate to that. You know, the truth is, I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not coming to you here from Greenpeace or the Sierra Club. That's not who I am. I've spent my adult life 
fighting for workers' rights, for economic rights, for human rights, in, inside our country and internationally. I marched with many of you against the World Trade Organization, against the IMF, against the G20, and we did this because of the impact of free trade on, on workers, on human rights. I wasn't so much concerned about the dolphins at the time, I'll be honest with you, but we understood the impact of the free trade agenda on our democracy, or we thought we understood it. I think it's worse than we even imagined. So the case I want to make to you is that climate change, when its full economic and moral implications are understood, is in fact the most powerful weapon progressives have ever had to fight for equality and social justice. But before we can really understand that, we have to stop looking away from the climate crisis, which is, I think, something we all do, which is not the same as denying it outright, you know, like the right does. But it's another kind of denialism. It's, you know, just letting yourself sort of sneak a peek at a scary headline and then kind of moving on because you can't really deal with the implications of it. And we all do that. We all do that. But I think once we stop looking away and once we let ourselves absorb the fact that the industrial revolution that led to our society's prosperity has now changed the earth itself, then something really radical happens. Now, first of all, I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of scary numbers, though I could remind you that the World Bank, which is hardly a bunch of pinkos, says that we're on track now for four degrees of warming in my son's lifetime. I could tell you that the International Energy Agency, again not a protest camp of green radicals, says that the World Bank is being too optimistic and we're actually on target, if we keep with business as usual, on target for six degrees of warming this century with, and I quote, catastrophic implications for us all. And that is an understatement because we have seen the effects of warming below one degree. That's what we're living with now. And we know what that looks like. 97% of Greenland's ice sheet melted last summer. As my friend Bill McKibben says, we've taken one of the great features of the planet and we've broken it. And then there are all the extreme weather events. You know, we don't really have summer anymore. We have disaster season. I was in Fort McMurray uh, in June and the contents of the town's museum, literally its history, was floating around in the water. I was trying to interview, to get interviews with heads of the big oil companies for this film we're working on, but their headquarters in Calgary were all empty, and the downtown was dark, and the city was frantically bailing out from the worst floods it had ever seen. But not even the NDP had the courage to say, this is what climate change looks like, and we're going to have to, to get ready for a lot more of it, especially if the oil companies get their way. Now, we know that this climate emergency is only going to get worse. And our excuses about why we can't do anything about it, why it's somebody else's problem, are melting away. Are melting away. But I want to tell you that engaging with climate, and I've talked to a lot of people on the left, a lot of friends on the left, about why they tend to look away. Not deny outright, but why they look away. And one of the reasons they give is that if they were to fully wrap their heads around this issue, and adopt it as their own and say this isn't the environmentalist problem, it's all of our problem, they said, well then I would have to stop everything else that I was doing because it's so big. And my message to you is that the exact opposite is true. Not only don't you have to stop your crucial work fighting austerity, fighting the cutbacks, fighting the attacks on the public sphere, fighting attacks on workers, but we need to double down on those fights because we absolutely cannot afford to lose those battles because we need these public institutions, those jobs, that social solidarity in an era of climate change more than we have ever needed them before. So it's not about dropping anything. It's about understanding that the climate change, that, the cl that climate change makes our battles all the more pressing far from trumping other issues, it vindicates what the left has been demanding for decades. In fact, climate change turbocharges our existing demands and gives them a basis in hard science. It tells us to be bold, to get ambitious, to play for keeps, because we cannot afford to lose. It inflames our vision for a better world with existential urgency. 
Now, I've spent a little bit of time with the sort of hard right Americans who deny climate change. I went to this conference of, of climate change deniers uh, in Washington, D.C., put on by the Heartland Institute. These are the real hard right guys. And what becomes clear when you hang out with them is that they understand climate change better than we do because they sit around and say it's a socialist conspiracy. It's just a big excuse to intervene in the market and regulate corporations and do away with free trade. You know, it's, it's just an excuse to, to have a planned economy. And the truth is, they're right. They're not right about the science. They're dead wrong about the science. 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are causing climate change. But they're right about the implications of the science, that if we listen to this, if we, if we listen to the scientists and accept it, we need to do so many of the things that we want to do anyway with great urgency. The right is so appalled by this that they have to deny the science. My question is, where is the left? Where are progressives? Why aren't we understanding that this is the best argument we have ever had? So you wanted our shock doctrine? This is our shock doctrine. <laughs> If you believe that climate change is real, if you understand the urgency and the deadline that we're on, we have to tear up the free market playbook, and we have to do so, as I said yesterday. So I want to lay out what a real climate agenda would look like if we took this seriously. And when I say a real climate agenda, I, mean, I don't mean the kind of stuff we've been getting from the big corporate green groups, it, particularly in the U.S., which is all these, you know, they, they have swallowed the neoliberal ideology and they have told us that we can deal with this crisis by changing our light bulbs, you know, by, by giving more power to the market with cap and trade. They have bungled this massively. The truth is this issue is too important to leave to the environmentalists. We need you to take it up. So, I mentioned that we're going to have to revive the public sphere. I mean, think about it. We need subways, streetcars, clean rail systems, not only everywhere, but affordable to everyone. We need energy efficient and affordable housing along those transit lines. We need smart grid, electrical grids carrying renewable energy. We need garbage collection, which has as its goal the elimination of garbage. And we don't just need this sort of new green infrastructure because we've already locked ourselves into a certain amount of climate change. We're seeing that with the extreme weather. And for decades, we've been fighting to protect the public sphere, to, to, to revitalize the public sphere. But we see again and again how those decades of cuts have left us more vulnerable to extreme weather. We've seen superstorms bursting through levees. We've seen heavy rain washing sewage into lakes. We see these wildfires raging out of control and underfunded uh, firefighters without the resources to fight them. Bridges and tunnels buckling under the new reality of heavy weather. So far from taking away, us away from these fights, climate change puts us right in the middle of them, but this time armed with arguments that raise the stakes significantly. It's not hyperbole to say that our future depends on our ability to win. That renewal, of the, that renewal of the public sphere, as you know, will create millions of jobs, high-paying union jobs. But it's not just about boilermakers and pipe fitters and construction workers and assembly line workers who would get these new jobs, because there are big parts of the economy that are already low carbon. They're the parts of the economy that are most disrespected, um, where they're facing the most demeaning attacks and the deepest cuts. These happen to be jobs dominated overwhelmingly by women, new immigrants, people of color. These are the sectors actually that we need to expand massively and we need to take those lousy paying jobs and turn them into well paying jobs. And we're seeing right now, and you already know this, but I think what you haven't fully realize is that that's a climate policy. That's a climate policy too. And you can use the urgency of the climate crisis to make that argument. And we're seeing how this works right now with the incredible uh, strikes of fast food workers in the United States. I mean, this has been an amazing work, an amazing week. And we could, we could build on that. The fast food strikes in the U.S., could be the first uprising in a sustained rebellion fighting for both real wages and real food, one in which the health of workers and the health of society are inextricably linked. So I hope it's clear by now that I'm not talking about some, a few token you know, green jobs here. This is about a green labor revolution. 
an epic vision for healing our country from the ravages of the past 30 years of neoliberalism and healing the planet at the same time. So the big question is, when you hear about all of these wonderful schemes, is how are we going to pay for it? Because, of course, we're broke, or at least we're told again and again that we're broke. But we also know that when an issue is urgent enough, in the eyes of those in power at least, whether it's a war or the need to bail out the banks, that money can be found. So this is why using the urgency of the climate crisis to supercharge your demands is so important. And the money is there. We have to go where the money is. And the money is with the fossil fuel companies and with the banks that finance them. We have to get our hands on some of their super profits to clean up the mess they've made. It's a very simple concept enshrined in law called polluter pays. Now, we're not going to get that money by continuing to extract more and more, which is the message we get from them, right? You know, just let us keep digging and we'll give you, a, a, we'll give you, you know, the, a, a, a share of it. The truth is we can't do that because what the science tells us is that we need to keep 80% of their proven reserves in the ground if we're going to stay below two degrees warming. Once again, I'm not going to get into the science. It's out there. You know it. It's called the carbon bubble or stranded assets. These companies have, have five times more carbon on their books in their proven reserves than the atmosphere can absorb and stay below two degrees. So they've essentially, their business model declares war on life on earth and we just can't leave it to them so we need to take less out and we need to keep more we need to keep more of the profits and there's lots of ways of doing that there's carbon taxes there's higher royalties those are the obvious ones there's financial transaction taxes which we've been talking about forever there's raising corporate taxes across the board there's closing loopholes there's at least getting rid of the subsidies and so on but once you start adopting a few of those policies, then digging holes isn't the only option on the table. And the CCPA did a really useful little study last year, Mark Lee wrote the study, um, looking at the, 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 en the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline, and, which you know, Enbridge put $5 billion on the table and a few thousand jobs and said, you know, this is an economic plan. Well, what, what Mark did is he you know, crunched the numbers and he figured out that if you spent that money on the pipeline, you get mostly short-term construction jobs. And of course, you create costs. You create public costs. You do what these companies do so well. They privatize their profits and they externalize their costs. And those costs are the cost of potential spills, but they're also the cost of climate change itself. Um, so, he, so that's one route. Um, if you spend the money on public transit, on the other hand, building, on building retrofits, on renewable energy, you get, at the very least, three times as many jobs, and at the high end, he calculated that you could get 36 times as many jobs. So, obviously one route makes a lot more sense. The issue is that Enbridge was the only one putting $5 billion on the table. The Harper government wasn't putting $5 billion on the table for a green transition, so there was nothing to compete with them. So, I think this is one of the things that environmentalists, you know, and I include myself in this category because I've been very involved in the pipeline fights. We haven't done a good enough job when we say no to one of these projects of saying yes at the same time, putting a concrete plan for how we raise the equivalent amount of money. Mark calculated that if there was a modest carbon tax um, of $10 a ton, then that would raise, amazingly enough, $5 billion. But not just once it would raise $5 billion every year so that we could put that money into that kind of a green transition. So this makes sense on paper, but in the real world, as I said, what you come up against is the ideology of neoliberalism itself. The ideology that all governments should be doing is getting out of the way of the market, getting out of the way of corporations, rolling out the red carpet for investments, and watching the market do its magic. Well, we've seen how that works. You know, a really great example that I think we all need to remember is more than a decade ago, British Petroleum announced that their name was no longer British Petroleum. It was now BP, which stood for Beyond Petroleum, and they changed their logo to a sunburst. And they announced that they were basically going to do what we're talking about, right? That they were going to take their profits from the, their fossil fuel business uh, side of the business and invest it in green energy. Um, and you know, there was a, they, they made some renewable energy investments for a while, and then they just decided it wasn't worth it. 
they decided to go back to their core competency, which was not just going after uh, fossil fuels, but going after some of the dirtiest fossil fuels on the planet. They got out of solar energy completely, because the truth is we cannot leave this to the market. They will do what they are built to do, which is maximize profits for their shareholders. That's all they know how to do. So what that means is that this transition needs to be publicly managed. And that means everything from new crown corporations in energy, to a huge redistribution of power, infrastructure, and investment. A democratically controlled, decentralized energy system operated in the public interest. This agenda is increasingly being called energy democracy. Sean Sweeney from the Global Labor Institute at Cornell, which is doing really the most visionary work in this area, is here today. Um, and He's been working with many fine unions, including the CEP, to articulate what an energy democracy agenda would look like. Um, and it's very exciting. It's time to bring this to Canada. And the slogan, Power to the People, is a fantastic place to start. Now, as you all know, there have been some modest attempts by provincial governments to play a more activist role in in having some kind of a green transition and saying no to doubling down on dirty energy. And what we're starting to see in those cases is very disturbing because in the provinces where governments have taken the most positive and boldest actions, they're starting to get dragged into trade court. And that brings me to the last piece of the real progressive climate agenda. And that's that it's time to rip up these so-called free trade deals once and for all. And, and we sure as hell cannot be signing new ones. Now you fought these deals for decades. The CAW played such a pivotal role fighting the first, very first free trade deal with the U.S. in the 80s. And as I said, you fought them for, for, for the reasons that we all understand, because they represented a race to the bottom for workers, um, and also because we understood that they represented attacks on our, on our democracy, on our ability to make our own laws in our own interests. And what we're finding out is that we were righter than we knew. Um, because the logic of free trade is now directly blocking us from making the specific changes that we need to reduce our emissions in the face of the climate threat. A, a quick, quick couple, uh, couple of examples. Ontario's green energy plan, now it's far from perfect, but it has a very sensible buy local provision that unions fought for so that wind and solar projects in Ontario can actually deliver jobs and economic benefits to local communities. The, you know, the sort of basic just transition principle. Well, the World Trade Organization decided that this measure was illegal. Um, the CAW is already in a coalition fighting back, but more green policies are going to face these precise kinds of corporate challenges because we've locked ourselves into these trade deals. Another example, Quebec has banned fracking, a courageous move um, which has now been taken up by two governments. But now... But now we have a U.S. drilling company, um, although it's, it, it's actually based in Canada, but it's, it, it's a U.S. drilling company is planning to sue Canada for $250 million under NAFTA's Chapter 11, claiming that the fracking ban interferes with its, quote, valuable right to mine for oil and gas under the St. Lawrence River. So we should have seen this coming. A WTO official was quoted almost a decade ago saying that the WTO ch challenges, quote, almost any measure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You can have a WTO challenge against any measure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, these maniacs think that trade should trump the health of the planet itself. They've decided this. We've had a lot of reasons to fight free trade in the past. I believe this one trumps them all. I believe this is the winning argument. I believe this shuts them down once and for good if we really get behind it. We can't wait for governments to give us permission to start this transition because they have locked themselves in. We're going to fight those battles, but as we fight those battles, we need to start building demonstration sites because I think a big part of the reason why we don't really believe these alternatives are possible is that we, there are so many people who have never seen it in their lifetime, so they need to start seeing it. 
So next time there's a big factory closure, and unfortunately there will be another one, and if that factory is making fossil fuel heavy machinery, whether cars or tractors or airplanes, how about if we don't let them do it? How about if we do what workers from Argentina to Greece to Chicago are doing and occupy the factory? You know, Sam Gindin proposed this when, the, when two of the big three went into bankruptcy, that they should be turned into green worker co-ops, go beyond negotiating a last sad severance, demand that the resources from companies and governments go to building the new economy that we need right here and now, whether that's electric trains, whether that's windmills. Watch that factory turn into a beacon for social movements across this country, students, anti-poverty activists, First Nations, all working together to fulfill that vision. That's what those occupied factories can become. Climate change is not your enemy. It's not a threat to, you, to your jobs. It is a threat to all of us, but it's also a tool. Pick it up. Use it to demand the supposedly impossible. All we need is a political power to make this vision a reality. If we stay true to a clear vision of the morality behind these demands, then we will change this conversation. We escape from the clutches of narrow free market economics where we're constantly being told to ask for less and demand less, and we find ourselves in a conversation about what kind of people we want to be, about what kind of world we want to leave for our kids, about what we're willing to risk in the name of profits. If we set the terms of that conversation, we back Stephen Harper up against the wall. We finally hold him accountable for the lethal ideology he serves, the one that he has been hiding behind that bland and boring mask of his. That is how we shift the battle of forces in this country. If Unifor becomes a voice for a boldly different economic vision, one that provides solutions to the attacks on working people, on poor people, and the attacks on the earth itself, then there will be no worries about the continued relevance of the labor movement. You can be sure of that. You will be on the front lines of the fight for the future. And everyone else, including the opposition parties, will fall in line. Now, I believe that a key part of, of, of achieving this shift is deepening your alliances with First Nations, whose, consti who, whose constitution constitutionally guaranteed title to land and resources is the biggest legal barrier Harper faces to his vision of Canada as an extraction and export machine. He wants to turn this country into a sacrifice zone. And to quote my friend uh, Clayton Thomas Mueller, who's been at the forefront um, of, the, of the, the, the battle to to bring a more sane economic model to the Tar Sands region. He says, imagine if the workers and First Nations people actually joined forces in a meaningful coalition, the rightful owners of the land side by side with the people working the mines and the pipeline coming together to demand another model. People in the earth on one side, predatory capitalism on the other. The Harper Tories wouldn't know what hit them. That is real power. Now, this is more than just these kinds of strategic alliances. They've got the legal rights, you've got the human power. It's not just that. It's that we need, as I said, our own story, a different story. And as we develop that story to counter Harper's one about endless extraction, we need to learn from the indigenous worldview. It's a worldview that tells us that you can't just take, but you have to give back whenever you harvest, that five-year plans are for kids, and that grown-ups think about seven generations, and that tell us that we are all connected. Because when we build these deep coalitions, we have to identify those threads that connect us all, and that tell us that it's not even just about joining all of our different struggles, but realizing that in some way this is all one struggle. So in closing, I just want to leave you with a word that I think is helpful in weaving together all of these struggles and understanding both what we're up against and what we could become. 
And that word is overburden. I kept thinking about that word when I was in the tar sands a couple of months ago. And you know, those of you who work in, in, the, in the extractive sector know this word. It's what mining companies um, use to describe. Uh, it's officially the waste earth covering a mineral deposit. That's overburden. But these companies have a strange definition of waste because it includes forests, it includes fertile soil, it includes rocks and clay, and basically anything that stands between them and the gold or the copper or the bitumen that they want to extract. Overburden is the life that gets in the way of money. It's life that is turned into garbage. And as we passed pile after pile of masticated earth by the side of the road, it occurred to me that it wasn't just the dense boreal forest that had been turned into overburden by these companies. Increasingly, we are all overburdened to them. That's the way the Harper government sees us, at least. Unions are overburdened since the rights that they have won are a barrier to unfettered greed. Environmentalists are overburdened for obvious reasons. Indigenous people are overburdened because of those rights just described. Scientists are overburdened because their research proves that climate change is real. Democracy itself is overburdened, whether it's the right of citizens to participate in environmental assessment hearings or the right of parliament to meet and decide on the future of this country. It's all getting in the way. This is the world deregulated capitalism has created, one in which anyone and anything can find themselves discarded, chewed up, and tossed on the slag heap. But overburden has another meaning as well. It also means simply to load with too great a burden, to push something beyond their limits. And I think that's a very good description of what we're experiencing right now. Our crumbling infrastructure is overburdened with new demands and old neglect. Our workers are overburdened by employers who treat their bodies like machines. Our streets and shelters are overburdened by those whose labor has been deemed disposable. The atmosphere is overburdened with the gases we are spewing into it. And it is in this context that we are hearing shouts of enough from all quarters, this much and no further. We heard it this past week from the fast food workers, a worker in Milwaukee who went on strike holding a sign that said simply, I am worth more, and in the process set off a debate about inequality in the United States. We heard it from the Quebec students, the courageous Quebec students who said no to a tuition increase and ended up unseating a government and sparking a national debate about the right to free education. <clears throat> We heard it from four women who said no to Harper's attacks on environmental protections and indigenous rights and pledged to be idle no more and in the process set off an indigenous rights uprising around the world. And we are hearing enough from the planet itself as it fights back in the only way it can. Everywhere, life is reasserting itself, insisting that it is not overburdened we are starting to realize that we have not only had enough, but there is enough. To quote Evo Morales, there is enough for all of us to live well. There just isn't enough for some of us to live better and better and better. To close off, I want to read an excerpt from your constitution, from Article 2. I think some of you have heard it already, but it bears repeating. Our goal is, transforma is, is transformative to reassert common interest over private interest. Our goal is to change our workplaces and our world. Our vision is compelling. It is to fundamentally change the economy with equality and social justice, restore and strengthen our democracy, and achieve an environmentally sustainable future. This is the basis of social unionism, a strong and progressive union culture, and a commitment to work in common cause with other progressives in Canada and around the world. Brothers and sisters, all I would add is don't say it if you don't mean it, because we really, really need you to mean it. Thank you.